All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to our uh, springtime, late spring, that doesn't feel like it today, but our, our late spring Florsheimer event, which we are calling The Future of History and Tradition, The First Amendment Implications of Bruin. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Michael Pollack. I am a professor of law here and co-director of the Florsheimer Center. Before introducing our panelists, I want to uh, introduce and thank my fellow co-director, Professor Ingber, um, our administrator, Pui Yang, who's just outside, um, and our student fellows, Melanie Rigdon, Jacqueline Hadziki, and uh, Josh Barzell for all of their terrific work uh, and helping us to, to organize this event and all of the rest of our events. So I'm going to begin by briefly introducing our guests, and then uh, we'll get started. I have some, uh, we've sort of planned some, some questions and conversation, uh, but of course we will leave some time for questions from you all at the end. So to my immediate left is Matthew Schaefer. Matthew is Vice President and Assistant General Counsel for Litigation at Paramount Global. He handles content litigation across Paramount subsidiaries like CBS News, Showtime, and Paramount Pictures. They focus on defamation, invasion of privacy, and copyright claims. He teaches media law at the Fordham University School of Law, boo, and <laughs> regularly writes on the history of press freedom in the United States. Previously, he was newsroom counsel at BuzzFeed News, where he advised teams that broke the news that R. Kelly was holding women in an abusive cult, that released thousands of secret records of misconduct at the NYPD, and that cataloged suspected Russian-linked assassinations on UK soil, for which BuzzFeed News was a Pulitzer finalist. Matthew is a graduate of the University of Illinois and the Georgetown University Law School, and he holds a master's degree in mass communication from Louisiana State University. To his left is Mary Rose Papandrea. She is the Samuel Ash Distinguished Professor of Constitutional Law at the University of North Carolina School of Law. Her teaching and research interests include constitutional law, media law, civil procedure, national security law, and torts. She is the author of numerous book chapters and journal articles, too few to list, too many to list here. <laughs> too many few. to list here. Um, <laughs> on media law and First Amendment topics, and she is the co-author of the casebook, Media and the Law. Professor Papandrea is a graduate of Yale College and the University of Chicago Law School, a former associate at Williams and Connolly, and a former law clerk to Judge John Codal here in the uh, SDNY, Judge Douglas Ginsburg of the DC Circuit Court of Appeals, and Supreme Court Justice David Souter. To her left, last but certainly not least, is Clay Calvert. Uh, Clay is a non-resident senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute at, in Washington, DC, and Professor Emeritus at the University of Florida. At UF, he held a joint appointment as Professor of Law at the Levin College of Law, and is a Breckner Eminent Scholar in Mass Communication in the College of Journalism and Communications. He has authored or co-authored more than 150 law journal articles on freedom of expression topics, and he is the author of the media law textbook, Mass Media Law. Mr. Calvert is a graduate of Stanford University and the University of the Pacific McGeorge School of Law, and he later earned a PhD in communication back at Stanford. So between their scholarly uh, background and work and uh, their practical work in the field, we have a tremendous panel here of folks to help us break down and understand more about the interaction between the court's new approach to history and constitutional law, its interaction with the First Amendment, and all of that, and how that interrelates to media law, libel, freedom of, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and so on, topics that I know are of interest to all of you here. So, to begin, I'm going to ask Clay to get us started by sort of situating a little bit what a typical or pre-Bruin First Amendment analysis would look like. So how, how the, the foundation of the baseline works, and then we can start to talk about where we think some changes might be afoot. So Clay. First of all, thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all today. It's an honor to be here. Uh, so Bruin, as we're going to find out, focuses on text, history, and tradition as an approach. So what I'm going to do uh, is set up the First Amendment, a traditional analysis of a statute. So if you've got a First Amendment-based statute out there and you want to analyze it, how that'll be, because in other words, we're going to look at what it currently is and then what Bruin might portend for it uh, in the future. So the first question you would ask is, is speech actually at issue in a regular First Amendment analysis? And that gets you into the speech versus conduct dichotomy, right? So if it's conduct, it's generally not protected, with the exception of if you have symbolic expression, like flag burning, even new dancing, things where you ask, 
One, is there an intent on the part of the actor to convey a specific meaning with that conduct? And two, is there a substantial likelihood under the circumstances in which that conduct is, is conveyed that some people in the audience will understand that? So that's the first question, is speech involved? The second question would be, if speech is involved, then we have to ask, does the speech fall into an unprotected category? And if it is an unprotected category, then it can be regulated. So you might say, is it obscenity? Uh, is it child pornography, which was the most recently uh, created exception from the First Amendment? True threats, fighting words, incitement to violence, speech that's integral to criminal conduct, fraud, and defamation would be there. But on that point, it's important to note that this is where history actually does come into play, that when the court wants to carve out a new category, in two cases, United States versus Stevens in 2010, uh, in Brown versus Entertainment Merchants Association in 2011, the court said that there has to be a long settled history, basically, of this speech in question uh, being regulated, uh, even if the Supreme Court has never heard it. Uh, and it's just as, um, uh, Get who, who it was, but in, in Brown versus Entertainment Merchants Association, Scalia? yeah, Scalia, yeah, Scalia, uh, he said there has to be a historical warrant, in other words. So this is where history does come in. It doesn't usually, uh, but it's on the question of is there an unprotected category? That's where you'd have to have that. But assuming the speech does not fall into an unprotected category, then it is going to be presumptively protected. And then our next step is to turn to the statutes that regulate it, and we focus on those statutes. And we ask, does it fall, is we're gonna say it's content based or content neutral, that's the next step. So we look at the statute and say, does it target out for regulation specific topic, subject matter or idea and not others? If it is, then it's content based and it's gonna be subject to strict scrutiny. If it applies even handedly to all subject matters, all ideas and all topics, in other words, it's neutral, that's what we call content neutral, it's then generally gonna be subject uh, to intermediate scrutiny. And which test you apply then, is it content neutral or content based? Do we apply strict scrutiny if content based or intermediate scrutiny if content neutral? Generally makes a big difference in terms of those standards, intermediate scrutiny and strict scrutiny have very different meanings. But both are, and this is important when we contrast it with, with, with Bruin, they are both means and balancing tests where we, in both tests, we look at what's the government's interest or the government's goal or the end, and then we look at how carefully tailored the terms of the statute, the means are for serving that. Strict scrutiny requires a tighter fit between the means and the ends, and a higher end, a compelling interest, and you can't restrict any more speech than is necessary to serve that interest, versus intermediate scrutiny, it only has to be a substantial, important, or significant interest versus compelling. And those terms do mean something more like terms of art. They really do have a meaning. And then the fit can be a little bit looser. Uh, you can regulate uh, more speech than is necessary as long as it's not substantially more speech. You can't burden that. So that's the initial step of how we work our way through this, the standards of scrutiny. Um, the next question, though, you might have, and there are exceptions to this general rule. So I just want to talk about three, and then we'll wrap this up. Uh, one is government speech. So if the government is the actual, and Mary Rose has written about uh, the government speech doctrine, oh, yeah. uh, what is it, the brand, the government brand? Yeah. Yeah, the government brand is the title of the article. I recommend it highly. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> Thank if it's- Thank you, Clay, yeah, for, so, it's one of my few articles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I could read it. Uh, but, but so if the government speaks, then there is no First Amendment issue. But what is determining what is government speech is problematic. Uh, but that's that's another exception. Another exception to this is commercial speech. So commercial speech, even though it's really content based, you're targeting out a particular type of advertisement for regulation. So if commercial speech is, is truthful and it's about a lawful good or service, then we're typically going to apply a variation of intermediate scrutiny. So that's a little bit different. And then the other one is what we call really second class speakers under the First Amendment. And there, by what I would mean by that, are we talking about public high school students and inmates, which obviously go together. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, in, in, those, in those categories, we really apply a variation of rational basis review. Uh, in fact, the, the test that they apply from the Hazelwood case in, in public schools is, is the regulation reasonably related to le legitimate pedagogical <laughs> teaching concerns. Uh, in, in the context of inmates, is it, uh, reasonably related to legitimate penological interest. You just substitute pedagogy and penological, <laughs> and that's the exact same test. So inmates and high school students at public schools are treated at that lower level. So that basically is, is the framework uh, for how we would do a traditional analysis of a statute that may involve speech. Okay, so 
that was you know a first amendment course in five minutes <laughs> um so now we're, we're going to talk about bruin of course that's a second amendment decision um so mary rose I mean, first, I guess, explain Bruin, and then why are we talking about a Second Amendment decision when we're talking about First Amendment? Yeah, no, that's great. So I'm sure all of you are aware that the court decided actually a trio of cases, Bruin, which is the Second Amendment case we're going to focus on, the Dobbs decision, which is the abortion decision overruling Roe versus Wade, and Kennedy versus Bremerton, which was the praying football coach case. And all three of those decisions, the court declared that constitutional analysis should be conducted with this text history and tradition approach, um, overruling prior approaches. Um, we're focusing on the Bruin, or we did in this article that we wrote, we focused on the Bruin. One of your few. Sorry. <laughs> one you of your few. few. Yeah, one of my few. You mean the other one? The other one. Yeah, the other one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, we, we focused on this one because this was the case where um, Justice Thomas writing for a majority of the court, so it's not just him on a frolic and detour, he actually, he says for the majority of the court that this text history and tradition approach is the same approach that we take in First Amendment cases. Um, this is uh, somewhat correct and mostly wrong, um, which is very curious. So that's what that's what you know. I remarked to Clay at a conference uh, that, and he was like, "Let's write about it." So we did. Um, uh, so the um, uh, it, so the Second Amendment jurisprudence, as you as you probably know, really is pretty recent because the court decided Heller in two thousand eight. Um, prior to Bruin, the courts were trying to suss out how to analyze restrictions on um, gun rights after Heller declared that it wasn't just a militia um, uh, type right. Um, and the courts were, oh, many of them, borrowing from the First Amendment. And part of what they borrowed were these tiers of scrutiny, um, intermediate and strict scrutiny. So they would ask, it does the Second Amendment, the language cover um, the whatever the regulation is, but assuming that there was some coverage that involved um, arms, uh, you know, then the court would not be bound by history and tradition, but instead would do a, a either um, intermediate or strict scrutiny. Um, and so what Bruin was uh, in part doing was saying, oh, no, 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 that's no, nope, nope, that's not what we're doing. We're not doing tiers of scrutiny. We're doing text, history and tradition. So under this analysis, the court will ask, does the uh, regulation fall within or is it covered by the Second Amendment. If it isn't, then you're done. It's not covered by the Second Amendment and we're out. Um, if it is covered by the Second Amendment, then we look at the history and traditions of this country to decide whether the regulation is constitutional. And that is period, that's all, that's it. Um, so that's the approach. Um, so this is not consistent with, um, with most of First Amendment jurisprudence, as Clay mentioned. Um, we do see it in defining categories. The court in Stevens and Brown, the violent video game case, both um, announced we were not going to do balancing tests to define a category or to accept a category of unprotected speech, and instead we would look at history. There are assorted other places where history has popped up and played not just a helpful role, and we'll talk about Sullivan in particular, where we do see history actually used in part um, for the analysis, but it's not the only part. Um, uh, one area that I'm interested in is the right of access to court proceedings, other government proceedings, the Richmond newspaper test. One uh, part of that test asks if there's a tradition of access um, uh, so that we do see it popping up in various places. The Walker um, government speech test um, uh, it, it, you know, whether it's actually a test or not is debated. I think it's a kind of a test, like a three-part test where one of the prongs asks about a history and tradition of, of whether the speech is, um, uh, you know, the government speech. Um, but, but by and large, you know, one thing I would add to what Clay um, said is a lot of what goes on in First Amendment, aside from the content-based, content-neutral plays a huge role in the court's analysis, is um, the theories of the First Amendment, you know, the marketplace of ideas, theories, self-governance theory. These theories are not rooted in the text of the First Amendment. Maybe um, we can talk maybe in the tradition, um, but but not necessarily so. When the court makes the decision, it's often a free, free floating inquiry into the marketplace of ideas um, or self-governance, not, not tied specifically to pointing to tradition. 
Um, the, the last thing I will add um, is we have so much to talk about here, but you know, one thing um, that I'm sure you've heard a lot of criticism of the um, of this new approach to constitutional law and this focus on history. Um, Thomas in the, again, writing for the majority and Bruin says that history, although he understands it's not always going to be easy, it's better than leaving decisions to the personal inclinations of the judges. Um, but the problem is there's so many unanswered questions, um, including in Bruin, and I'm just gonna highlight Justice Barrett's um, concurrence in Bruin, where she highlights some of the problems. Um, uh, she says, um, you know, some critical questions that remain open are, you know, the manner and circumstances in which post ratification practice may bear on the original meaning of the Constitution, how long after ratification may subsequent practice illuminate original public meaning, what form must that practice take to carry weight in the constitutional analysis, uh, and whether courts should primarily rely on the prevailing understanding of an individual right when the 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868 or when the Bill of Rights was ratified in 1791. Um, Justice Breyer's dissent added, you know, how do you pick among historians and even historical sources to decide which ones to credit, which ones not to credit? Um, how many cases or how many laws or examples do you need to demonstrate a history or tradition? We really don't know and have answers to this. And the last thing I'll say, I'm stealing this phrase from Matthew, is that we see in Bruin and definitely in Dobbs, the abortion case, uh, and, and actually Kennedy, the Bremington case had like no analysis at all, but um, is a buffet of historical sources um, where just sort of, um, I think the Dobbs case went from like the 13th century to current times. It was very, or at least 1973. Um, so it's not entirely sure how to do this analysis. Um, Clay and I are interested, and Matthew as well, if this is how the court's going to do the analysis, First Amendment um, advocates do need to take it very seriously. We're so grateful. Matthew is uh, uh, doing a lot of this hard work um, on the side of history. So I'm going to just stop and turn it over, I think, maybe to Matthew or whomever. Well, before we get to, to that, and I, and I do want to get into all, I, I want to sort of stop on the, the test itself. Oh, sure. Right. So what are some of the, I mean, you, you, you've alluded to some of the difficulties of doing, you know, how do you, how do you choose all the things that Barrett and, and Breyer said? Um, are there other sort of difficulties that you see in applying this test specifically in the First Amendment context, right? So there might be difficulties with doing history and tradition analysis in general, but are there any specific difficulties with sort of doing that in the First Amendment analysis? And that's, that's for anybody. Yeah, go Matt. You talk. Okay. <laughs> um, I think that presents difficulties because we used to cut people's ears off um, for what they said. Um, and I, seriously, obviously. Um, so I, I don't think you can really, I think the top line is history is useful, but it can't be determinative. And we're, I think we're all concerned that we're drifting towards it is determinative. Um, when the past is a very ugly place and, you know, being beholden to it is going to be problematic. It also presupposes that historians agree on everything. And I think historians would probably be the first to say that there is not broad agreement on all sorts of historical events. History is not a monolith. It depends on what perspectives you're looking at this from. But I wanna just, um, as the radiator rattles, I wanna just contextualize this a little bit. It's history speaking to you. Right, exactly. Um, so, I'm going to go back to the 13th century and we're going to come forward very quickly. So back in 13th century England, you have these statutes. They're called Scandalum Magnanum. The monarchy adopts these statutes. Why? To protect um, the, the peerage, right? To protect the important and powerful people in England. We don't have a printing press in England, right? Not yet. The printing press will come at the end of the 15th century. So you have this law for the first couple hundred years, and it is meant to stop people from speaking. We then get the printing press, 
The problem is scandal and magnanum applies only to manuscripts, right? That is things we're writing with our hands. It doesn't apply to the printing press. So we, so the folks, we, um, the folks in England decide, well, what we're going to do is we're going to start licensing the press. We're also going to turn to things like treason to control what people say. And when I say licensing the press, much like you have a driver's license to drive a car, you would actually have to have a license from the stationer's company saying that you have the, the right and ability to operate a press, which obviously you're gonna operate a press in a way that's beneficial to uh, the powers that be. We get to 1605 because for some reason, Latin is a thing. Um, there's a case called Delibulus De Famosus. And that is kind of, we can think about there are three things, licensing, treason, and libel. And what that case does, Delibulus Famosus, is it is an invented doctrine um, that was just created during that case. It's about two pages long, all of our libel law, all of our common law of libel. I have the 1605 book at home because I'm such a weirdo, but all of our common law of libel comes from about two and a half pages. And what they said in those two and a half pages um, was that uh, truth is not a defense, right? So if you say something and it's true, it doesn't matter. If it harms that individual's reputation, you're still going to be on the hook for it. It also goes so far as to say you can libel the dead, right? So someone's in the ground, you libel them, you can be held responsible for that. So fast forward, we're going to keep moving forward. We get past the glorious revolution in 1688, we get to 1694, 1695, and the, the, what you're having happen over the 17th century is the proliferation of speech and written material. The presses continue to print material. It becomes more and more difficult to keep Republican, um, you know, small r, Republican values at bay. And finally, parliament decides to let the licensing expire. What that means is um, treason prosecutions have been going down. Licensing is no longer a thing. So now the main place you control speech is through libel law, right? And we get to um, the colonies. We're finally here. Um, we're here in New York. It is, say, seven, the 1730s, the mid-1730s. And you have this battle, again, Republican ideas against the monarchy, right? We all know that there was a war fought after all. <laughs> And I want to just take a, a few seconds to read from a, a closing argument in one case. Um, that it was the King versus Zenger. He was a German printer who operated what would have been downtown from here at the time. Um, and he had been, uh, the, the colonists here would not issue uh, a indictment in a grand jury. He was ultimately arrested on information. Uh, we went you know, the authorities at the time downtown went around, gathered up all of his papers, started a fire downtown and threw all of his newspapers that he was printing into the fire, held him in jail. He fed notes to his wife at the time to keep his uh, paper being published. And he was um, ultimately defended um, by a, a Philadelphia lawyer um, who, Andrew Hamilton, not Alexander, um, who came over from Philadelphia and gave a closing argument contrary to case de libelis famosus that I mentioned. And he said, but to conclude the question before the court and you gentlemen of the jury is not of small nor private concern. It is not the cause of a poor printer nor of New York alone, which you are now trying. No, it may be in its consequence affect every free man that lives under a British government on the main of America. It is the best cause. It is the cause of liberty. And I make no doubt that your upright conduct this day will not only entitle you to the love and esteem of your fellow citizens, but every man who prefers freedom to a life of slavery will bless and honor you as men who have baffled the attempt of tyranny and by an impartial and uncorrupt verdict have laid a noble foundation for securing to ourselves, our posterity, and our neighbors that to which the nature of the laws of our country have given us a right, no, the liberty, both of exposing and opposing arbitrary power in these parts of the world, at least by speaking and writing truth. 
And that is a Republican idea that really, as Justice Thomas said in one opinion, that set the colonies ablaze with revolutionary thoughts. And I have gone back and I have read the newspapers around this time leading up to um, the, the Stamp Act, uh, the Intolerable Acts, the revolution, and they are in bars downtown toasting to this case. I don't know how many of you toast to cases at bars. <laughs> it was apparently a thing no, that, that was done, <laughs> exactly. A, di but, a different bar exam. A different bar exam. <laughs> but, so I, I'll wrap up, but what I, the point I want to make is you cannot understand our intellectual history or our cultural identity with freedom of speech unless you understand it contrasted to the English history of freedom of speech. And I'll say, you know, this tradition, I won't go through the many, many examples, but this tradition continued through the 19th century. And um, you know, the last example I'll raise is in the context of abolition. Again, this idea that speech and um, political and civil pro progress are um, undeniably linked. There was a, a printer who actually, his brother lived in my hometown growing up. And um, this is the 1830s. And his name was Elijah Lovejoy. He was killed um, because he was advocating for abolition um, in the mid 1830s. The, he wrote a, a letter to his mother um, a month before uh, a mob um, found him and killed him. And I'll just leave you with this, with this uh, excerpt of that letter. He says, my press has again been mobbed down I believe Brother Owen has written to you about it. It was done the 21st of August, Monday night, about 11 o'clock, but, but I have thought perhaps you would like to hear from me, and I would have written sooner, but that I have been so hurried and so worried and so busy that I could not snatch the time. Do not think, Mother, that I am disheartened or discouraged. Neither is true. I never was more convinced of the righteousness of the cause and the certainty of its ultimate triumph. As thy, day, as thy day is, so shall thy strength be. The truth of this promise I have abundantly experienced. I've been enabled to bear things, easily to bear them, that I should once have thought would have crushed me to the earth. And as I said, he was killed a month later for what he printed. So I find the idea that we're going to turn to the past to define what we think of as freedom of speech and freedom of press today, um, you know, borderline spurious. Reflections? Yeah. Clay, Mary Rose, anything you want to? You know, I think that the Zenger case uh, to which you referred is, is, is famous. It's really an example, too, of jury nullification, where, as you said, truth was not a defense, correct? And, and this is the case where the jury says, no, we're not going to buy that. And so that's, that's another sidelight on that case that's important. You'd ask initially, too, about what problems would exist uh, in terms of applying text, history, and tradition. One I think that Mary and Rose and I wrote about is even the word speech itself, right? What does speech mean? And I mentioned that speech versus conduct dichotomy and sometimes conduct flag burning can rise to the level of speech. Would that actually be the case? If we only look at the text, what do we mean by speech itself? Is it, is it the written word? Is it on words on the internet? Well, there were so many problems. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, okay, so my reaction is that uh, I don't think the court's serious here. What's yeah. really frustrating, um, you know, I teach con law right now and super frustrating because, I mean, there's never been consistency at the court, let's be honest, but right now there's truly, there is no consistency. And I don't think that they, when, and actually going since Bruin, they have not, and we could, we could look at it even more closely than we did when this article came out, but they, they actually are not using history, text, and tradition to resolve First Amendment questions, by and large, um, uh, they might mention history, but it's not determinative. Because if they did, I don't think they would like the results, and not not just uh, you know by case by case. But I mean, uh, you know, they really love, for example, the marketplace of ideas. They really, really love as a as a whole. The court really loves that that theory of the First Amendment, and if you get rid of all of the court's jurisprudence in this area and rely solely on history, you won't be able to be as wedded to the marketplace of ideas. You would um, allow state and federal um, actors to punish speech that they don't like. So, I, you know, it's uh, the history is not good. 
Um, and but it also would would I just don't I'm not sure the court actually has a stomach for it. So I, I'm actually going to deviate a little bit from our plan because I think that what you just said, Mary Rose, segues so nicely into the court's recent arguments in February in the net choice cases. Mm. So thinking about adapting history to a new technology, to the marketplace of ideas and so on, right? So um, I guess, Clay, do you just want to sort of explain a little bit what these cases are, are about for folks and then we can talk about how the argument went or what we think. Oh, what happened in the lower court, you have to Yeah. Well, too. you can get to that. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Sure, yeah. but the two cases, so there are two big cases on February 26th, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments in the two cases, Net Choice uh, versus Paxton out of Texas and Moody versus Net Choice out of Florida. Both deal with red state regulation of private business entities trying to uh, interfere with their editorial control and discretion uh, on internet. So here's basically what's going on. So after Trump, we all remember, gets deplatformed uh, after the riots on January 6, he gets deplatformed by both Twitter uh, and Facebook. So what's the response from Florida, which is a red state? Florida then enacts a statute, the one that issue uh, in the Moody case, uh, that bans the deplatforming of candidates who are legally qualified in the state of Florida for either state or local office. It bans them from being deplatformed from large platforms, those with more than 100 million users or 100 million in annual revenue. So you're really targeting the largest platforms here. So no matter how many times if you were a candidate running for public office, you violated the terms of use and service about acceptable speech, you could get away with it. You cannot be deplatformed. So that's one facet of that. The Texas one is, is interesting, and that's in that case, uh, it bans viewpoint-based discrimination. So typically we think about viewpoint-based discrimination as, as involving the government, right? The government cannot take sides on the topic of abortion and allow only pro-choice but not pro-life. That would be viewpoint-based discrimination as a classic example. But what the Texas statute does is it prohibits private entities from engaging in viewpoint-based discrimination. And so what that would mean is, as applied, that if you had a hateful viewpoint, a racist viewpoint, a sexist viewpoint, all the types of things that most of these platforms have, right? They typically say we'll ban uh, hate speech. And even though it's protected by the First Amendment, they will have their own policies on these things. But because it's viewpoint-based, then you can't get rid of that content. And so it's really a battle between the First Amendment rights of editorial control and discretion of private businesses to control the type of speech that they want to host, to enforce their policies about their own free speech communities, versus the government then coming in and interfering with them and saying, no, you have to host these people, these candidates running for office. You have to host all viewpoints. And this is kind of which gets into the history and tradition part. One of the key arguments that both Florida uh, and Texas made, the solicitor generals from both states, is that there is a long history and tradition of common carrier regulation. And they go back to the, 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 the telegraph companies, telephone companies, and they, what their big argument is, is if you are a common carrier, then you cannot discriminate against viewpoint. And so if we think about common carriers in a non, in a different speech related context, but it would be FedEx or UPS. When you give them the package with a letter in it, right, FedEx and UPS are not going to be able to open up your package and say, oh, you're, you're writing about this viewpoint or that viewpoint, we're not going to transport it. So they're, what basically think about common carriers, they simply transport speech or move speech from point A to point B. And that's the argument that the states are making. And it's, it's became very clear what they're saying. There's a long history and tradition of this. And so under the, the part of Bruin, right, we ask, does it, does it cover, does the text cover the speech if we were to go down that? But what they're saying, is there then any historical warrant for allowing this kind of regulation? They're saying, oh, common carrier. We've got a long history and tradition of it. And you hold yourselves out there, although they don't. Uh, they always have these policies about will allow this speech or not. So that's basically what those two cases are about. And I can get into it a little bit later on if we want to talk about it. But the Fifth Circuit's court of opinion uh, in the Paxton case, the one coming out of Texas, is written like a text history and tradition. It is a text history and tradition analysis. It is so different than the Moody case. So if you look at the two and you want to study these, and you would go through. Moody is a traditional from the 11th Circuit, yeah. uh, which strikes down most of the laws with the exception of some disclosure parts. It's a traditional First Amendment analysis. The analysis by the Fifth Circuit turns it all on its head, uh, and we can go over it later. Uh, but it really tees it up if, if Justice Thomas and Justice Alito want to go that way of embracing 
a text history and tradition approach? I mean, they go so far as to say at the outset of their analysis, basically, like, well, petitioners are only, uh, or plaintiffs are only um, citing precedent. They're not citing history and tradition. It, as if like citing precedent is you know somehow improper um, in federal appellate courts. No, it's a great line. If, if, if I could, just, yeah. yeah. So, so this is in the opinion by the Fifth Circuit. Rather than mount any challenge under the original public meaning of the First Amendment, the plaintiffs instead focus their attention on Supreme Court doctrine. <laughs> you don't have to go to class anymore. Um, or you should be going to a history class. Or going to, yeah. <laughs> Um, but I, I will say just one thing on yeah, the yes. on a historical analog point. Um, and again, this was um, organic private actors deciding how to approach these issues. But back in the late late 1730s, I believe, uh, Benjamin Franklin wrote his apology to printers, and uh, he had been caught up in a kerfuffle for something he had printed, and he um, basically said, um, "My press." is not a stagecoach for which everyone has a seat, right? This idea that he is has the right and ability, the editorial discretion to exclude people from his press. He then goes on to say, however, if they separately pay me, right? So he's got, he's printing newspapers. He says, but, so I'm not gonna put them in the newspaper or I have no obligation to put viewpoints that I disagree with in the newspaper, but, if you want to print or if you want to pay me to print it separately as a pamphlet or something as a broadside right if you want to pay me to do that separately that i'm totally okay with um but there is just a tradition especially before 1765 where there was this um there was this idea that forget the distinction between the private printing and the newspaper for a second but where there's this idea that if you did own a press you actually did have an obligation whether printing it separately or including a letter or correspondence in a newspaper, you did have an obligation to um, place those viewpoints or to print those viewpoints. Uh, and that stems from this idea that liberty of the press at the time, as it was understood, was every individual's right. Uh, it was just that printers were the necessary intermediate step to um, allow that right uh, to actually uh, manifest in the real world. And not everyone could have, not everyone could be a printer, not everyone could have a printing press. Right, right? yes. But, so, yeah. but, but now we live in a world, of course, where everyone effectively does have access to their own right. printing press, right? We're teetering on the edge of people going to sleep if I say what I'm about to say, but I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> the most, fun fact, um, or maybe not. Um, the most expensive aspect of a printing press uh, was actually the metal type. Uh, it would take around 100 pounds to get a printing press off the ground in the last half of um, the 18th century. Um, but uh, around 65, 70 pounds um, was uh, buying just the type that you would use to press it. So if anyone went to sleep, you're excused. <laughs> But I think what you're bringing up sort of raises the, the some of these difficulties of adapting history to a very different um, technological or sort of physical era, right, where where so much of that doctrine or that, I shouldn't say the doctrine, because apparently it's not what we're supposed to look at, so much of that history is built on a technological premise, right, that, that is absent today. Right, so I think that, that sort of gets yeah, some and, of the And I the, think the, in, the uh, in Bruin, um, Thomas recognizes that they are not going to be stuck back in, uh, mm -hmm. in time. And in fact, that wouldn't suit right. their purposes, because then what do you do about, right. you know, semi-automatic weapons that did not exist? And so he says that we need to look for an analog. And that's, I think, with the social media regulation cases, you know, they're trying to decide, is this more like the Telegraph or is it more like a newspaper? And, um, you know, obviously it's hard. it doesn't fit exactly into either one, but this will be a problem, you know, picking the right analog will continue to be one of the many difficulties with this approach. And um, one of the things I include in the article that I do teach con law right now, I just started substantive due process. And I know those of you who studied it, you know that one of the conflicts in the court, it, well, before they moved to text history and tradition was to pick, like, how do you define the right at interest? And so if you define the right very narrowly, 
less likely you find a historical tradition to back it up, the more broadly you define it, the more likely you'd find a historical right. So I see a, um, a very similar thing going on with this text history and tradition approach in um, the second, maybe first, maybe who knows where, uh, where we are looking for these analogs. Um, there's gonna be a lot of power in the decision makers to pick the relevant uh, analog and it's not scientific. And that's one of the problems actually right now in the net choice cases, what is the correct analog? And so the big case that they talk about is from 50 years ago, uh, which is Miami Herald Publishing Company versus Tornello, Patrick Tornello, uh, who was a candidate for office. And so in Tornello, the United States Supreme Court struck down a Florida statute that we will call a right of reply statute. So when the Miami Herald opined and criticized Tornello running for office, uh, the Florida statute allowed Tornillo to be given the same space free of charge to have his reply. The, to go back to Mary Rose's point about the marketplace of ideas, that was ostensibly designed to serve the marketplace of ideas because if the Miami, if you read the Miami Herald, you get its view, Pat Tornillo bad. Now Tornillo is given free space. He doesn't have to pay for it. Now you're in the audience. So, oh, now I know Tornillo's view. There's more speech in the marketplace of ideas. The Supreme Court struck that down and basically said editing is for editors, but it goes to a point that you mentioned about the technology, a large part of that dealt with because it is the printing press versus broadcasting. We have a finite number of frequencies in the airwaves. And so the, the traditional justification for more closely regulating uh, broadcasting is spectrum scarcity, right? Versus when it came to the printing press, the finite limitation from the court, although it weighs a lot apparently, uh, uh, is simply economic. Anybody could own a printing press if you have the money to own the printing press, which people don't, but you could own it. So there's a difference between physical scarcity of the spectrum and the financial scarcity that it would take to own a printing press. So anyway, Tornillo though, so if you think it, Tornillo is a huge victory for the press, right? Because they're stri they strike down Florida statute, editing's for editors, and that's all about editorial control and discretion. And so this is the case where the size, Florida and Texas, on the one hand, nope, Tornillo is not the correct analog uh, that you have here. A shopping center is. They're saying this case called Prune Yard Shopping Center from California, that you really are like a shopping center. You're a business. Uh, and there in the Prune Yard case, the court said that a public shopping center had to allow some kids, actually, who were leafletting, right, to distribute leaflets uh, there. Uh, the states would, or excuse me, the states, Net Choice, which is a trade association, would say, no, 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 uh, we're in the speech business. A shopping center is not in the speech business. It's about, you know, the gap or whatever, whatever I don't go to the mall as much, but uh, <laughs> you know, hey, it's, it's about an Orange Julius place. <laughs> things, right? So uh, they have malls anymore. Uh, so, so really, what is the correct analog? And so the courts, the Fifth Circuit, in the one that I quoted there, they reject Tornillo as the as the correct analog. Uh, but clearly, net choice is saying, no, 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 no. When we create our terms of use and terms of service about acceptable content, we are sending a message, and that is it, right? We decide our own speech community. Uh, the problem, I think, to get further is when you think about something like Reddit, where then you have subreddits where the individual communities establish their own terms. You know, I don't think the Florida and Texas legislators were really thinking about something like that uh, in that case. Hmm. Um, so something else I want to sort of then circle back to is something that Matt was talking about earlier about libel. So um, those of you who have taken Kamala, you know, New York Times versus Sullivan, sort of the biggest precedent, at least at this point, um, with respect to um, our ability to um, say things about public figures and to not be held liable for libeling or slandering those public figures. Uh, but that's a case that um, pre former President Trump has been very critical of, that Justice Thomas, Justice Gorsuch have been sort of critical of within their different norms of what counts as how they frame their criticism. Um, but they've been critical of that. So Matt, can you tell us a little bit about what you think the, I mean, maybe just say a little bit more than I did about what Sullivan is, but um, the future of Sullivan or what you're concerned about in terms of this his text history and tradition approach and libel law? Sure. So, um, so Sullivan is a libel case, um, is all the, also the reason why I can call myself a constitutional lawyer and not just a personal injury lawyer. Uh, so libel is obviously a state tort, 
before 1964, when Sullivan was decided, uh, libel was not subject to um, any constitutional, well, maybe that's overstating it, but by and large, it's not subject to any constitutional restraints. Uh, there were some cases in the 40s that were trying to test that. Um, but in um, 1964, you have the New York Times runs an advertisement in support of Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, that advertisement had, I think, 60 something uh, signatories to it. Alabama, there was actually a, a rich tradition in the in the South, and I think one that we see today with um, uh, President Trump uh, and and others trying to revive it, frankly, of using libel law, uh, contrary to that Republican uh, tradition that I uh, mentioned earlier, to force critics into silence. Right? Um, there was one. Uh, journalist or it was actually I think it was someone at a, a NGO at the time uh, back in the during the civil rights movement that said that southern officials were using libel laws to reverse the verdict at, at Appomattox just to give you an idea of you know the, the severity of this problem uh, civil rights organizations were having to move out of the south um, because of the risk that their speech would um, result in massive libel verdicts against them. So we see libel being used, again, to prevent progress. Um, so that's the, the frame in which Sullivan occurs. Um, Sullivan's also, it's often talked about as a, as a media case. There were also um, uh, several black ministers who were sued because they were signatories on the advertisement. They actually, um, uh, never gave their permission to have their names included, but their names were included on the advertisement. By including them, Strong there was diversity. no diversity jurisdiction. Right. It's all about CIPPRO. <laughs> <laughs> she, she lectures me on Pinoy every night. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, you're fine. You're fine. And actually, Mary Rose was the one who um, originally invited me to this, so I should say thank you for oh. uh, inv inviting me while, while we're on my, the My compliment to Mary Rose, and this is the highest compliment I give oh, anybody my. in academia, <laughs> Is that she's normal, and, that's <laughs> and we cannot say that about you. That is that that. No, back to that. Um, so <laughs> we have um, we have a, a libel trial down in Alabama. This is libel trial. It's held by a judge uh, who literally had a jury after a Civil War reenactment come in. This was not during the the New York Times trial, but previously come in in uh, Confederate garb and sit as a jury in Confederate uniforms, just to give you an idea. Um, the the lawyers for uh, the civil rights leaders who were black, um, they were not referred to by the honorific Mister. Right, they were referred to only as lawyer. Um, so just to give you a uh, you know a, a little feel for what these proceedings were like, so the case gets to uh, the Supreme Court. The fear is that the New York Times and um, CBS, where I work, um, was uh, subject to so many libel verdicts and libel trials that were on their way uh, that there was a risk um, that you could potentially have these libel verdicts put these uh, news organizations out of business. And that's the corporate side of things. The much more real um, practical side of things was for the ministers who had their bank accounts seized um, their cars repossessed, and they were also going after their, their homes. Uh, so it was a dire situation for the individuals. They get to the Supreme Court, and uh, the Supreme Court reverses the verdict uh, that was in favor of the official who was named in this advertisement critically, or he wasn't named actually, excuse me, but he suggested because the advertisement uh, was in support of Martin Luther King Jr., um, and it talked about his interactions with the police in the South that it necessarily reflected in a defamatory way on him, this particular public official, L.B. Sullivan. And um, so the court, um, here's the case, and the plea is exactly that, that the First Amendment, actually, we have a tradition in this country that the First Amendment protects speech about public officials, um, about matters of public concern. Uh, that pitch is made to the court, and the court, um, accepts that pitch and reverses the uh, verdict below. And I think as Mary Rose said earlier, there was um, a, a, at least a little bit of history, or maybe it was Clay, a little bit of history in um, Sullivan. They looked back to 1798 to uh, the Sedition Act. It's a, a law passed um, 
in the run up to the election of 1800 to essentially uh, guarantee or try to guarantee Adams reelection. Um, helpfully, it failed. Um, and uh, the court said that the um, response to the Sedition Act was really encapsulated our tradition in this country, um, because this, since the Sedition Act landed um, several dozen people in jail just for political speech, the court looked back and said, well, Adams lost the election of 1800 when Jefferson came into office. He forgave the fines under the Sedition Act um, and also released those who had been uh, jailed under it. And that while the court had never had an opportunity to pass on the constitutionality of the Sedition Act, uh, the court of history had, and in our country, the tradition is that um, your office, high or low, does not insulate you from political criticism. And so um, to get to the, the crux of the question, and I have to start getting to the point faster, um, the Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch have said, well, actually, that's not our tradition. They have gone back farther. This goes to Mary Rose's um, comment on um, where do we look. They've gone back farther. And they said, well, in the 13th century, scandalum magnanum was a thing. And re to remind you, that's the, the law that protects those who are high officers, right? The peerage, uh, the king, the queen, whatever it might be. And they said that that is the relevant tradition to look at, which is a little strange because in Bruin, there were some uncomfortable uh, English statutes that cut against the idea of uh, a personal right to bear arms. And in that context, Justice Thomas said, well, that is way too far away from where we are now, right? So there's this problem with the buffet of history where you have jurists, rather than actually constrain, it, it's a liberalizing uh, doctrine. It gives jurists the ability to basically walk up to the buffet of history and say, you know, I would like some of that chocolate cake, but I don't want, you know, this other thing over here. And um, I think that's no way to run a judiciary. I mean, even just in your story about the Sedition Act, right? Like. So, okay, we, we rejected that by electing President Jefferson, but we also elected President Adams who enacted the Sedition Act, right? So it is, it is equally part of our tradition to have the Sedition Act and, and closer to not in have time it. Right, to the ratification. Right. Like, yeah. They are both equally part of our history and the enactment of it is closer in time to the ratification of the First Amendment. Yeah, so in, um, in, in 1789, um, to be uh, Justice um, Cushing, um, wrote to John Adams and said, um, we know what liberty of speech, liberty of the press uh, means in England, but the question for us is what does it mean here and now? Um, and it was clear that in their correspondence that they thought they had a broader conception than the one that Justice Thomas points to of history, or excuse me, of freedom or liberty of the press and speech in America. But to get to your point about Adams being elected, I think we have to um, uh, moderate or handicap that humans will or are self-interested, mm -hmm. that politics are politics, and the fact that um, Adams did what he did um, might just be political expediency at the end of the day. But again, that's a another problem with what how do we weigh mm -hmm. historical exactly. evidence? Right, right. When I think you're absolutely right, but when 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 we take into account that these historical actors are self-interested and not necessarily principled or themselves consistent, it makes the historical record all that more yeah. muddy. Anything else you guys want Well I, I just want to go back to um you know, this idea that it's not like Sullivan was devoid of history. It did yeah. cite a fair amount of history and um, and and try to also engage in analogs, you know, as well to try to figure out what the proper comparison is. So, you know, it's looking at the Alien Sedition Act, which isn't exactly libel law, you know, as being the relevant um, tradition to consider. But, um, you know, it is important to recognize it's not like the court never looked at history before. It's just it, it typically would not be determinative. It was a way of telling a story, exactly, you know, yeah. um, and uh, and I guess it was less offensive because it wasn't determinative. But we could equally have had concern with, you know, at the time Sullivan was 
decide. I mean, it was not clear what was going to happen in Sullivan because the court had previously in its own, like in dicta, said that libel was an unprotected category of speech. And so it wasn't looking good. Um, you know, it's also the product of its time. Right, right. You know, I should just say really quick, um, I haven't told you what the rule is for Sullivan, which is probably hiding useful. the ball. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you're a natural professor. <laughs> yeah, you're ready. <laughs> so what Sullivan does, the court adopts what's called the actual malice rule. Uh, to Mary Rose's point, this was a rule that developed in our common law um, throughout the, the 19th century and that the court essentially constitutionalized in Sullivan. And the actual malice rule is this, that if a if a public official is attempting to hold liable in, uh, an individual for um, defamatory speech, in addition to all of the normal elements of a defamation claim, the public official will have to plead and ultimately prove that the defendant acted with actual malice, which is defined as knowledge of falsity or a high degree of awareness of probable falsity or serious doubts as to the truth of the matter. Um, there's also another definition that's not horribly useful useful called reckless disregard for the truth, um, which suggests that there might be some sort of a kind of negligence objective standard. But in fact, the actual malice standard looks at what did the person when they said or when they wrote what they wrote, um, what was that person uh, thinking about that allegation? So did they know that they were lying, right? It was this a willful lie um, and in the news context, that's a very powerful antidote because um, journalists do not um, write stories, report stories um, that can contain knowing lies in them. Um, that has been my experience. There are obviously people on in various, you know, the definition of journalist has loosened. Yeah, that's yeah. the problem. Sure. Standards, I think is what you're saying. And it's not um, just for journalists, the standard. But it's a very, yeah, but it, exactly. It's, and it's not just for journalists. So, but it's a very high bar to show that someone subjectively in their mind knew at the time that they said the thing that it was a, a calculated falsehood. And this is really what Trump meant when he said he wanted to loosen up libel laws when he was running in 2016. He was talking about basically rolling back Times versus Sullivan actual malice standard. In fact, in Florida now for two years in a row, and it's been defeated, but it, it's not gotten through or signed, uh, actually never made it through the legislature, so it never got to DeSantis' desk, but uh, there were two bills that would roll back, uh, roll back the actual malice standard in terms of who can constitute, who constitutes a public figure. So it's, it's highly controversial. I mean, of course, a, to be clear, right? A, 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 stat, a state statute, of course, cannot right. yeah. <laughs> overrule Sullivan. And, and, but but, it, but but it's a, it's, but, can it, it. but it's a way to set up the litigation that right. would see you know, Texas it, immigration. It, exactly. Yeah, they're trying to tee it up, basically, yeah. to get it to that court. And then the court has had multiple opportunities to take that case. And even though we get Mary Rose, I've talked about this. You get two different attacks on it, right? You get. You get Thomas focusing on it's not their history, and I think it's at Gorsuch who yeah. who says the media changed so much today that in 1964 we did have the big news organizations, the Times, the Post, maybe even the Wall Street Journal, and others, and they all abided by a certain code of ethics, most tried to at least, right? And now everybody can claim they're a journalist, and so there was kind of this maybe I don't know if it's true, but almost an unwritten kind of notion that you're a journalist, you're a member of the press, you're doing something noble and important, and we're going to accord and afford you this actual malice, knowledge of falsity, or reckless disregard for the truth defense that you have, right? The state of mind requirement. <clears throat> but now everybody and their brother and sister, whatever, can say that they are a journalist, and so I think that's what. Uh, Gorsuch is more concerned about, I think. So so it's under attack and it, it, it is under siege. But yeah, the Florida part, we just want to, I always think if you've heard of the, a Florida man, I always think it's a Florida law. It's kind of like a, a Florida law. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I will say um, I was very, the reason why I started um, getting interested in this topic is I was very concerned that Thomas and Gorsuch were going to get four votes, right? You need four votes to grant cert on any given case. So a case like that say the Florida law became um, became the law of the land, and um, that ultimately got to the Supreme Court on a challenge. I was very concerned that there might be four votes. Um, it's worth noting that last term in Counterman versus Colorado, um, the court 
imported that Sullivan actual malice standard into a into another context, into the criminal context, which I think should give us a, a little bit of a time to exhale as far as the likelihood that the court were to revisit Sullivan. Uh, is it possible? It's still possible, of course, but I, I would think that they wouldn't have, and actually Justice Thomas in that case criticized the court for extending Sullivan precisely for the reasons that he had said the court should revisit Sullivan. Um, but I don't think that you would have gotten a large majority of the court importing Sullivan into another uh, uh, area of law if there was the four votes there to actually revisit it. Also, that's a great example where the court did not use text history and tradition. It right. was defining what is a true threat and it it didn't use text history and tradition right. that 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 was after Bruin. And so. yeah, in last week in um, Freed or Lindkey oh, yeah. versus Freed, another First Amendment case, no text right. history right. or tradition there either. And the court basically there, it had to create a standard. It created a rule. Yeah, it just made much. something up. Yeah. yeah, it created a two part rule for this is the one about uh, government officials blocking you on social media and when you sue like Trump blocking people in the Knight First Amendment Institute case, right? Yeah. But the question to this is who has standing really, or excuse me, state action. Uh, if I am a government official and I'm using kind of these hybrid accounts, right? Where is their state action? Where do we draw that line? And so what the court did in that case, it, it created to the good side of the test, at least whether you like the test or not, is there was a unanimous opinion. So you had all nine justices. There was no concurring opinion to water it down and no dissent to question it. It's got two prongs. Uh, they're fairly simple to understand. The application is not going to be easy to understand. But yeah, so so I, I was waiting for kind of I was really waiting for the pushback from Thomas. Aren't we just legislating here yeah. and creating a balancing test because you're balancing the free speech rights of a government official to talk on a social media account privately, versus, privately yeah. right in a private. Yeah, you're balancing that interest about public and you can talk about matters of public concern in your private capacity versus the First Amendment rights of speech and petition of citizens to interact with them. So you're balancing and they created, it's basically a balancing test. But I mean, what would that analog have looked like, right? I mean, that's no, also I, where yeah. the test breaks. Right, that's, right. Yeah. There, there is no history right. no. there, because that's, that, that, that's, that's only enabled by the technology we have today, yeah, and the right. social media we have today. Um, before, I, I do want to open it for questions, but I do just want to ask, since we, we talked about the net choice cases earlier, and that, argue, that oral argument was, was recent, and now we're just sort of talking about court speculating. So I'm just curious, I guess I'll start with Clay, but I'll, we'll go down the line. Do you have any speculation about how um, the court's likely to resolve the net choice cases and um, the social media content moderation policies? Yeah, I, I think the, ma the majority of the court will strike down both cases. I think they will. I think you will see the, the common carrier argument Thomas really buys into. He bought into it in the denial of certiorari because the case was rendered moot in the Knight First Amendment case when the Supreme Court had an opportunity and he bought into the common carrier notion. So if you see anything happening in that, it would be more limited in my view at least and just uh, with Alito and Thomas on one side. I think we, we've, we're seeing this more. I think we were listened to the oral uh, arguments uh, the other day at Murphy versus Missouri too. <laughs> that the center is almost holding in a way in some of these cases where Roberts and Kavanaugh and Barrett are, they're not buying the- Can you it, explain what the Murphy case was? Oh, so Murphy, yeah, Murphy versus Missouri is the jawboning case. This is the ones where uh, Louisiana, I'm sorry, yeah, Louisiana and Missouri, hence Murphy versus Missouri, Murphy's the Surgeon General. Uh, Missouri and Louisiana and five individuals uh, sued uh, the federal government <clears throat> saying that they were trying to verbally arm twist essentially social media platforms to take down content that dissented from the Biden administration's narrative on mask mandates and COVID-19 vaccines. So three individuals are the authors of the, or two of them are the Great Barrington Declaration, which is basically saying that the government's going about the uh, vaccine mandates wrong, complete shutdowns are wrong. So it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting case about either state action or the First Amendment. Because instead of drafting a law to regulate what the social media platforms doing, the argument from Missouri and in, in Louisiana is that no, in email correspondence and at the platform of the podium, the bully pulpit, uh, they are trying to twist them and get the platforms to remove this content that's objectionable, right? Because we need state action. So when the platforms remove content, there's no First Amendment actor, right? And so they're private, they could do what they want. 
But the argument of Missouri and Louisiana is it's really not that we should impute it and attribute it back to the government because you're having all these communications uh, that, we don't, that we weren't privy to in that case. So in that case, during oral argument two, we were talking about it. It was, it was very interesting. I think you had, especially Kavanaugh, who's, who's worked in the White House, he was very skeptical of this type of, of, of regulation, should, or not regulation, he was, he was very skeptical of Missouri's views and Louisiana's views, uh, but also uh, Roberts uh, and, and, and Justice Barrett. So that, which leaves you with either Alito and Thomas, and then what do you do with Gorsuch? And I, think, right. I don't know. That's, my, that's how I see it. I don't know. Well, um, back to the uh, net choice cases, one thing, as I recall uh, from the oral argument, is that they're, uh, I mean, they're desperate to avoid actually deciding the actual merits. So one issue came up was the nature of the challenge was a facial challenge versus an as applied challenge. And so there was a lot of questions at oral argument about, you know, would this, uh, uh, you know, to whom does this apply and aren't there some ways it would be uh, constitutional. And, and so maybe they'll try to dodge it entirely. The, the, yeah, that the factual record was not yeah, adequately developed. Yeah, the factual developed. record wasn't there, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's, that's one thing that they can do. But then they've got this, both laws are not enforced right now. Right. And so the question is, what do you do with this? How do right. you get out of it? And, the, and the, it is interesting because Net Choice did challenge it as a facial challenge. And then, so then Texas and Florida saying, nah, 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 it's all your fault, <laughs> right, is what they're trying to say. So anyway. Um, so I should say one thing that I should have said at the beginning, since I'm the corporate person up here, in case it wasn't already clear, these are totally my own views. Um, but uh, as to the net choice question, I agree with Mary Rose. I mean, it, there, the discussion about overbreath and facial challenges. So facial challenges are very important because when you, ha you can have legislatures pass absolutely crazy laws that might chill people's speech, right? Because there's the threat that they'll, um, because of their breath, they'll be used against them to discriminate against them based on their viewpoint. And the court, at least, a, I don't know, three or four justices seem to think that they should um, tighten up facial challenges in the context of the First Amendment, which gives me a, a lot of concern. That was in the, the, the Florida case. Uh, if they do that, that will be seriously problematic. It sounds like they were saying that net choice what should could not bring a challenge if any um, application of the law might be constitutional, which is not really how we do facial challenges in the First Amendment context. Um, so it, this is not a prediction, but a hope. Um, I hope that they reverse the Fifth Circuit, and I think they have good reason to, because again, the Fifth Circuit said, who cares about Supreme Court doctrine, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, if that's not reversible error, I don't really know what is. Um, and I hope they dismiss as improvidently granted the 11th Circuit case, which is just a fancy way of saying we shouldn't have taken this um, and just leave that one well enough alone. But I don't actually think that's going to that's a good analysis, actually, yeah, but, it, but, it, but, it, but it is. That would be good because they're, they're, they're into it now. And so it's like, how do they, I think they recognized in a way, you know, have you ever done something and you get into it, then you realize, oh, I don't have enough information or right. a way to figure out. I think that's where they are. Like, one of those challenges is, so I, 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 when I clerked in the court, the term I was there was, um, the court heard a case called Alonus versus the United States. So that's oh, true. A, a, a predecessor to this right. counterman case right. that they were, uh, that we were just talking about a little while ago. And that got that sort of also got decided on non meritsy grounds, right? The court sort of dodged it, dodged it and, and ran away to do something else. Um, <laughs> but it came back, right? That's 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 the that's thing. Ultimately, you cannot avoid these mm -hmm. these questions, right? So the court might try to get away from it uh, now, but it's it going to come back again. And I think maybe to dissent slightly from the panel, I, I think the, some of the justices are tired of having to keep returning to these questions. Mm -hmm. And if there is a majority, and that's of course the big right. thing, but if they can get five justices, I think they just want to resolve some things. Yeah. But if they can't get the five, then that's of course where things fall apart. No, I agree. And it's, it's a question of like judicial minimalism, which Roberts is known for in some contexts, but obviously not others. Right. But nonetheless, it's like, if you keep nibbling so small, you never develop the doctrine. So right. the counterman case was finally, the question was what state of mind must right. a, a de criminal defendant have, right? Yeah. And they, and that again, there's like, the, you've got all these different levels. Do you actually have the intent? Do you have the knowledge? Right. 
do you have recklessness? They decided on that one, or is it purely objective? But that, and, and um, I think it was Sotomayor mm -hmm. in, in Perez, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, which was a, sorry we're off the tangent but anyway so she was she was livid in this one case because this guy was convicted for making he was drunk and he was at a Publix which we have in Florida right and so uh, uh, he was drunk and he made a joke about a Molotov cocktail or something like this and he even referred to Henley as a local drink right from the song and uh, uh, but he was convicted and thrown in jail and she said okay you've got a guy who's drunk and, and he made a joke and you're putting him in jail for this you got to address this we need to take it sometime and so yeah, I think you're right. Kicking the can down the road yeah. doesn't get them far. Okay, questions from you guys. Jonathan. Hi. Um, so we've, a lot of this panel has been about history and tradition and figuring out what exactly that means in a lot of different contexts. But like, one, who, like, who has the onus to actually like, do that research? Yeah. Are we going to be relying on amicus briefs? Are we going to be sending clerks to the Library of Congress to like go and do their own research and figure it out for the justices? Like, you know, obviously history is not totally agreed on, and there was some discussion of that. But like, how are the justices getting that historical information in the first place? Well, I mean, the way they got it in these cases is a largely through the briefs and then their own amateur historical research. You know, in the district courts or you know you could have constitutional questions in state courts as well it's a great unanswered question i think there was one judge who said i'm going to hire a historian and he asked the parties yeah, yeah. should yeah. we hire an expert historian to address these questions because he, he says i'm not an expert right i, I forget the case it was a yeah. district court. i think it was judge reeves carlton reeves i think um but i forget the yeah. case um in alabama yeah, alabama yeah, yeah. It was alabama. so it's yeah. just going to lead to more problems because the you know this isn't going to be possible and so you're going to have judges relying on whatever history they can cobble together from whatever sources are available and present themselves and it, it, it's not great situation I, yeah i will say there is scholarship obviously there's scholarship out there on the practical question to get to that point that just that originalists have not yet been able to explain how to even if we accept it as a valid methodology like how or method of interpretation like how as a practical matter does that work in you know the circuit court for maryland or something right like you lawyers judges don't have time to do and i think it really is like offensive to historians yeah, yeah. too right like you don't have time to do the work that needs to be done and so you're left you know rather than making the 13 course meal by yourself you're back at the buffet of history just like picking whatever you want other questions i have more i can say about that but other questions sorry so I'm curious about the, the future of state action doctrine in this uh, world you've sketched out, because as you probably saw, last Friday the court decided Linky versus, Missouri, uh, Linky versus Free, yeah. um, which it, I think tees up in some ways the potential fight in Linky versus Missouri. A city manager in Port Huron, Michigan has a Facebook page, either blocks people from commenting on certain posts or just blocks them across the page. And the standard set forth now is you have to be acting under your, uh, you have to have actual authority to do what you're, to see what you're saying, and purport to be acting under the authority that you actually have. So that's a tightening of, of state action. It's not clear to me which way that cuts on the Murphy versus Missouri side for jaw bombing on one hand, and the common carrier cases, which frequently tend to blur the, the state action doctrine uh, and impute to private actors the authority uh, government so do you have some sense of which way well I, I you know I'll just say on the um on the net choice cases it is notable we didn't hear um, argument that the carriers are themselves state actors so that's that is an argument that is made in the scholarship it is an argument that litigants make and lose on um and so I think that we're I mean I I don't think we're going to see the social media companies declared state actors themselves which uh, I don't think the court has appetite for that. They still like corporate America. So well, it's interesting, right? There, there was this case a few terms ago, Pallock, uh -huh. uh, um, where the court sort of did 
call a, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was a public TV station, mm -hmm. right? Or a, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Public access yeah. station, right? Um, so it's not, not, not quite the same, but um, to the point that I think you've all been making, like th there's inconsistencies all over the place oh, here, yeah, right? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. I, will, I will say on the history and state actor question, there's an interesting strand of thought and I need to stop putting people to sleep. There's an interesting strand of thought in the 18th century um, where you have people recognizing the printers, and this is not just because they have government contracts, right? A lot of printers kept their presses afloat because they had government contracts to print laws and whatnot. Um, but the print, you have third parties recognizing that printers are in their capacity as a printer, a quasi government actor, mm -hmm. right? And it, it goes to the fourth estate in a very like direct sort of way. Sometimes individuals call the press the fourth estate, right? They're the fourth branch that checks the others. Um, but it is just there is that historical analogy to this idea that maybe at some point you get so important um, in the public dialogue that you sh I'm not endorsing the position, but that you should be considered some kind of quasi public official. And, and back to your question specifically, then in the jawboning case, um, there, there were some questions at oral argument about actual authority to carry out some sort of threat. So it's possible we would see that so if some low level government employees making a call to meta versus you know the very high level person um, then you you would perhaps have a distinction made there yeah lower courts at some courts i think the second circuit and the ninth it, it created this four part test basically and that was one of the factors does the government official who is doing this do they actually have the capacity or authority right to enact that so i think that's where that comes in and to your question to follow up on that too I think that really is a, uh, an issue in Murthy is you've got two cases out there, Bantam Books, uh, which is one, which is really a, the jawboning case uh, versus another one, Blum versus Uretsky. Mm -hmm. So you've got a state action case and you've got a non-state action, which of those is going to control. Uh, but uh, Bantam Books, I think, is kind of intriguing just to, historically, if, since we're going down the road of history. <laughs> hopefully this won't put you to sleep, but it's interesting. So uh, there was a Rhode it Island porn, so it won't. No, no <laughs> it, it does. It kind of does. So Bantam Books is obviously uh, a publisher of books, uh, and the case involved a distributor, Silverstein and Sons, and a Rhode Island Commission of Morality uh, was basically putting the squeeze on Silverstein and Sons, the distributor, saying the books that you are selling are obscene. Uh, so rather than going to an obscenity trial, this government commission then leverages the speech intermediary, and that's really what Silverstein is like, and that's what the, the platforms are like. They're speech intermediaries is the analogy, right? Because they host your speech, and the government's trying to leverage them, the host, to take your speech down. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where that comes through. But in Bantam Books, there were much more direct threats. Uh, it was clear. They said implied threats. Uh, you know, and they would come back, the, the commission would people would come back by and say, so what have you done? And, and Silverstein said, I, I was able to take down a few books from my shelves, basically, and then, then he would get by that way. So, so that's a, it's a great question, uh, how they will go on state, is it state action or is it just this jawboning notion of undue government coercion? One of the things that I think is just interesting in that conversation that all of you were just having, right, is it's hard enough to draw these analogies to precedent, right? And now Absolutely. we're supposed to draw really analogies point. to history too, mm -hmm. right? And the idea, sort of back to where you started us, Mary Rose, right, the idea that this is going to be somehow easier right. or clearer yeah. mm -hmm. is, no, it's not. Did you have a question? I thought I saw your hand. What else? Yeah. Thank you for um, the topic. I hope, um, hope that helps me with my class that I'm not reading for. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I hope that I can formulate this question in a way that makes sense. So you've been talking about how, um, how the court is approaching um, whether speech is protected. And I'm curious what you think about um, the distinction between conduct and speech, which one of you talked about a little bit at the beginning, um, and whether that distinction has also changed. And I'm thinking of a, a couple of um, cases specifically. One is Kennedy, where there was um, prayer, and prayer, my first thought, is um, religious exercise as opposed to speech. Um, and Gorsuch, I think you wrote it, didn't really distinguish those two, 
when you're analyzing um, what was protected about that prayer. And then another one is um, making a website being expressive for for gay couple gay yeah. as whether that's conduct or uh, yeah. or what's the matter. Well, I could well, have, if you start. Sure. So, so another term, that, in addition to the symbolic speech doctrine, one of the things the court focuses on, is it inherently expressive? And so that's another way. So is, is the masterpiece cake shop, is the making of a website, right? And those are all the speech-based cases that, that we would have. Uh, Bremerton, you had both speech and religion, right? Mm -hmm. So you had the two basically intertwined in terms of which way, which way you're going to go. Uh, I think uh, on the 303 creative case, once you say it's an inherently expressive speech product, that's the way they're going to try, some justices will try to limit the scope of that, that this opinion is limited to inherently expressive speech products and the extent a website is inherently expressive, even if it's an off the rack kind of pret -a port because we're near some places that study that. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, maybe they're still saying there's speech involved, right? And it's, it's inherently expressive. Uh, but I think the symbolic speech doctrine, the two-part test, intent to convey a particularized message, and two is substantial likely it's going to be understood. That's pretty well uh, established. That's just my thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what you would do with a history text no, how and would, tradition, no. like how you would sort that out. Um, I, I also should mention there, there's so many other things that might fall if the court took this seriously, the text history and tradition, like the freedom of association, the right of association, um, the incorporation. To, anyway, there's mm -hmm. a lot of things. The press clause, does it mean something? Maybe they need to actually do something with it. Um, on 303 Creative, there were so many stipulations made by Colorado in that case to make it super annoying um, as a precedent because you have basically a stipulation that it is expressive um, even though we don't know that she ever was going to make um, a, a website or that it, it is expressive versus uh, off the shelf kind of thing because um, i know a lot of my students have like the not.com and they, they're the ones plugging in you know the plug and play model for example so i'm not sure how we don't have great answers on that i think clay's right if we use the test that's been around there are going to be some hard questions on the margin but the courts have grappled with them and you know they'll sort them out some will be expressive speech you know will count as speech some won't um, i don't think your three creative is terribly helpful because of all the the concessions that colorado made i will say on 303 creative in the briefing in that case they did raise that because it was shortly after bruin um they did raise the historical that there's no historical analog for these sorts of um uh, statutes or regulations, whatever the case may have been, um, pointing at Bruin that you have to, they, the government has to show some sort of analog in order to win in this case. That was relegated to, I think, like the last page or two of their brief. So even they didn't take it horribly serious. Um, but you do have advocates that are um, <coughs> trying to put Bruin into the speech box. Uh, on your other question about speech and religion, for whatever it might be worth on the historical perspective. I mean, liberty of the press, freedom of the press was traditionally the um, uh, more commonly discussed right. Um, freedom of speech is really kind of like a post-1908 sort of thing. Um, that's a little overstating it, but traditionally it's been liberty of the press, which has been the focus where freedom of speech does come in and where it makes sense to the extent there's some conflation in the doctrine is really in the religious context. Um, freedom of speech and religion um, were often seen as um, going hand in hand, not least because there were often pastors giving sermons right to their, their flocks and whatnot. Um, and so there is actually a historical relationship between free expression or freedom of speech, excuse me, and freedom of religion too. Interesting. All right. Well, with that, our time is up. Thank you all for coming. Please join me in thanking our panel.